Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Um, my name is Andreas Temmer, and I'm the team lead marketing here at Impulsion. I want to welcome you to our very first webinar on the development of the Impulsion uh, Neo Propulsion System. And we are very excited that so many of you joined us today. The Impulsion Neo will be the most powerful FEEP thruster ever designed, FEEP being Impulsion's proprietary field emission electric propulsion technology, behind which are more than 30 years of research and development work in cooperation with the European Space Agency, as well as the Fotec Research Facility here in Austria. Our expert today is Dr. Luc Rimaud. He is one of our system engineers at Impulsion, and he is also head of the development team for the Impulsion Neo propulsion system. Um, he will show you all the latest news on the development, the milestones, the timeline, and everything else there is to know. But before we get started, we have some organizational information for you. We have the microphones muted and the cameras turned off for all attendees. Also, the chat function is disabled. But if you have any questions during Lou's presentation, um, feel free to use the Q&A section here on Teams um, to send your questions to our team. After the presentation, we will have a Q&A session with Lou uh, where we can hopefully answer most of your questions. Um, it may, may be the case that we cannot answer every single question uh, directly in the webinar, but we will share the contacts of our sales team after the webinar in a separate email. Um, so without further ado, welcome Lou Grimaud. Uh, we are glad to have you on our webinar today, and we are looking forward to your presentation. So Lou, um, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Andreas. Um, yeah, as uh, Andreas said, uh, I'm Le Grimaud. I'm the uh, system engineer product manager for uh, the um, Neo propulsion system. Um, and I want to show you a little bit what is uh, or there has been our development process and our thought behind uh, this new product. So as um, a lot of you probably already know, uh, Unfortunate has been flying quite a lot of thrusters. Uh, we have more than 100 in space, uh, uh, near 200 now, um, used for all kinds of propulsion applications. So what you can see on the right uh, here is you know, like all the spacecraft we can track who, uh, which have one of our propulsion system on board, or at least one of them. Um, we have seen people doing constellation deployment with, uh, with all the associated uh, propulsion tasks uh, that we see usually. So station keeping, orbit raising, orbit phasing. Uh, we have seen people doing uh, formation flying, collision avoidance for that, and all the way down to uh, low LEO uh, application where uh, they use them for drag compensation, but also all the way up to geo missions uh, where uh, we had a successful one uh, a few uh, weeks ago. Um, and of course, uh, also one of the hot topics for propulsion and sustainable space now, uh, the end of life uh, management of the thruster for the orbit or raising to parking of it. Uh, we even have uh, some flight model that have been delivered, uh, but not yet launched for um, uh, deep space applications. So this kind of uh, overview of the market through our nano and micro products uh, have given us some uh, kind of uh, it's insight on, on where we see the market going and where we see a lot of the, um, of the commercial application going. And what we see is one is that a lot of uh, the small sats are not so small anymore. Uh, and this is a few things. Uh, while uh, maybe a decade ago people were very into CubeSat for commercial application, we see that a CubeSat is very limiting in terms of sensor size uh, for your payload. Uh, we see also that the price per kilogram does not scale down favorably. It's not linear with a smaller spacecraft uh, costing a lot less to launch than a bigger one. And then uh, we see that for those higher capacity uh, for commercial payloads that people want, uh, the volume, the power, and the mass of the spacecraft is increasing. 
So a lot of the uh, commercial spacecraft now are more, are more what you see on the right, right, where we see we have um, those transporter launch with uh, a lot of ESPA, ESPA Grande uh, standard uh, spacecraft there, uh, where it's very interesting for a low to medium quantity cons con uh, constellation where a flat pack design, for example, is not necessarily worth it. Um, we see that uh, those spacecraft often have very large total impulse need, um, and especially when you start to include end-of-life disposal uh, coming down from uh, even 600 kilometers uh, is not free. And uh, a lot of the spacecraft have also more limited in terms of volume than mass. Uh, and lastly, a great thing for electric propulsion is uh, we see a lot of them with a lot of power available, uh, so which makes electric propulsion a very attractive solution for those, uh, those kind of missions. So, as Andreas uh, said, uh, all of our thrusters have been developed around uh, FIP technology, which uh, basically relies on tiny em ion emitters uh, that are. Uh, build around a needle that we uh, sharpen to micron uh, uh, deep sharpness. And those needles are made of porous material where we flow uh, our propellant inside. So in our case, it's indium metal. And uh, we apply a very high electric field at the tip of the needle, which directly extract the ions uh, from the tip of the needle. The Big advantage is that uh, you can really control the flow of ions through uh, the intensity of the electric field, and uh, there is no uh, gas or management to do, so everything is passively fed through capillary reaction. The issue is that each of these tiny needles is uh, generate really a minuscule amount of current and thrust, um, so you need a lot of them to produce meaningful uh, thrust. So far, our system has been based around um, what we call the crown emitter uh, that was developed by Fotec uh, quite some years ago now, where we have 28 needles in a round, in a circle shape um, that let us achieve a relatively uh, high uh, thrust for, let's say, 40 watt systems. Uh, we have scaled up this system to 100 watt on the on the micro thruster, uh, where we put multiple of those crowns uh, on the same thruster. But to scale that up even further, uh, what we decided to do is to unwind uh, this crown into what we call a linear array or a form of needle, uh, where we go from tens of needles to thousands of needles. And unwinding these needles lets us have a really high packing density and then a decent uh, thrust um, density. So what you can see here is the Neo thruster, um, or the thruster head, uh, with uh, all of those rows of needles, horizontal row of needles uh, that are um, in the thruster face. Increasing the number of needles uh, also lets us increase the thrust to power ratio, uh, partly due to the fact that we have less parasitic loss uh, from propellant management, neutralization, and that kind of thing. So for those who are familiar with the nano and micro thruster, uh, a lot of them are um, integrated systems uh, where we, what you get uh, at delivery is a box where you just um, attach uh, communication and power, uh, a thermal interface, and that's everything. For the new thruster, where we see uh, a much higher power uh, vision and uh, spacecraft that are not built to the same standards, uh, for example, not around a CubeSat system, uh, we have decided to kind of split the thruster into uh, three different sub-elements. The first one is, of course, what you see on the right, uh, the thruster head, uh, which uh, is responsible for the thrust generation. Uh, also include the propellant tank right, directly below the, those needles uh, and the propellant temperature management system. Uh, the goal of this thrust ahead is to be panel mounted um, on one of the panel of the spacecraft and then to be also uh, able to fit within most of the commercially available 15 inch separation ring, which is kind of the standard for uh, SPA class uh, spacecraft. 
Um, we are looking at a system with around 20 kilograms of propellant and a 6 kilogram dry mass sort of across the head. Uh, and the idea is to make the integration as easy as possible, so without any cooling requirements, uh, anything that uh, would make it uh, difficult to integrate there. We have a neutralizer, uh, which is there for um, spacecraft potential control, based around the dry cathode system, uh, and that is technology is very similar to uh, traveling wave tube uh, cathode there, that are used in, in a lot of geo platforms. And lastly, we have our uh, PPU, Power Processing Unit, uh, that we decided to split off to uh, make thermal management a little bit easier, uh, because even with the high-performance PPU, that's still where most of the, of the thermal dissipation happen and where most of the cooling uh, is, is, needs to happen. The idea is to be able to put this PPU on the cold panel on your spacecraft or somewhere where it's convenient to keep it cold. Um, and this PPU has, uh, lift several uh, systems that we are already flying for the nano and micro. Uh, basically, all the control and telemetry system, um, well, these low voltage systems are uh, basic, directly derived from uh, the nano R3 um, uh, boards. And then we are developing with a partner a high voltage uh, conversion unit. Uh, and all of this, as like please as the first generation is aimed at the Leo market, uh, where we see a lot of uh, the commercial application going. And by Leo, we mean uh, radiation hardness around 30 kilorad at the component level um, and reliability for a 10 year uh, mission, typically. So, in terms of system level um, uh, data, uh, what you get is um, a nominal thrust around 17 million newton uh, for uh, around uh, one kilowatt system power. So it, this is like input to the PPU. Uh, and then as with our other propulsion system, uh, you have the chance to be able to, to uh, operate it at lower power uh, if you want, uh, for if you do not have the power due to spacecraft constraint or operation constraint. Um, we, take, we try to take advantage of the high, high ISP possibility of our system, so to be able to operate it at 2,500 seconds. Um, and in terms of interface, uh, we are looking at least at first for a 50 watt, a 50 volt unregulated bus um, and uh, a communication either serial for a, a RS-485 or CAN bus. Uh, that's what we have identified as the main um, commercial interest there. In terms of operation, um, indium uh, as a solid metal uh, needs to be heated up. So we can go from a cold state uh, to a ready to fire state um, in about uh, 3.5 hours uh, nominal in normal operation condition, uh, up to five hours if you are really in a very, very cold spacecraft. Uh, and then you need about 50 watts to, to maintain this hot standby uh, mode. And then from this hot standby, uh, you can fire in about an, in under a minute uh, from, from that hot standby there. And then one firing, you can adjust on the fly the operating uh, point, uh, so the thrust, uh, your input power available, or that kind of thing. And um, as with our other propulsion system, you can also uh, directly control it in thrust. Um, so one of the advantage of FIP technology is that the physics is relatively simple, at least the thrust generation physics. Uh, so we can have a closed loop um, uh, thrust control system from, from all these characteristics. So one thing we are uh, using at that is very different also from, from a lot of other propulsion system is indium as a propellant. So indium is one of those weird metal that people usually don't really uh, see uh, much, but it's actually pretty common uh, and very much used for um, computer screens and LCD screens, uh, that kind of thing. So it's a relatively abundant uh, metal and one of the uh, with relatively uh, low price and, and, and large supply chain. Um, so this is particularly interesting for uh, people looking at that larger constellation where, where propellant uh, can be an issue. Uh, I mean, we have seen what xenon price have been doing over the past few years. Um, 
it's an extremely dense propellant, uh, at the same density as steel. Um, so it lets us have actually a very low volume in terms of our thruster. And it's non-toxic and non-pressurized. So we ship basically the thruster full uh, of propellant and there is no special waivers or uh, safety consideration to, to have there, um, which uh, reduce also um, constraint integration. And uh, what you see on the top there is kind of a, an equivalent volume for the same total impulse uh, for the different propellant, uh, knowing that uh, in this case, the indium and the iodine has zero pressure, uh, near zero pressure, while uh, the xenon and krypton are typically 100 bar, 200 bar tanks there. All right, so how does the uh, neo thruster kind of compares to um, existing product in that range? Because uh, for those who know electric propulsion in the one kilowatt system, there is uh, there are already uh, a number of uh, hole thrusters typically uh, that are the, the kind of the reference there. But one thing that uh, where we really cannot compete is the thrust to power ratio, uh, just from physics alone. Uh, so we are between half and a third of the uh, power to thrust ratio uh, or, or thrust to power ratio, sorry, of a uh, hole thruster, and uh, yeah, so this is something where uh, for extremely power and time constrained mission, uh, we know we uh, we are limited. However, um, we can get uh, where it can be interesting in terms of system level design is that uh, the, the new system is uh, very light, uh, not just due to the ISP, but also the full system um, integration. So if you look at a total impulse for total system mass, um, you see that uh, the neo thruster is um, is about 50% uh, lighter than an equivalent whole thruster for the same total impulse. And this is partly thanks to the low pressure tank, uh, partly um, uh, thanks to the higher ISP there. And one thing that also people don't always look at, but that wanted to highlight here um, is uh, the very high total impulse for a given volume. Uh, so the fact that the propellant is so dense, um, it uh, makes us uh, very efficient in terms of space there. So uh, you don't need any, uh, so the, the propellant is stored in the thruster head directly, uh, so you don't have any internal tank, and you also don't need any special routing for uh, propellant feed. Uh, which might also need to be connected or welded or clean uh, during integration, that kind of thing. Um, but it's something also to keep in mind, especially for uh, space clouds that are more volume constraint than uh, power constraint. All right, so um, what have we been doing in terms of development so far? Um, one of the big efforts on our side has been really this um, scaling up of this needle uh, emitter production uh, aspect. So, uh, and that has been done through several ways. Uh, one is uh, our emitter production is based around an injection molding process. So really refining its injection molding and uh, also investing in our own machinery to basically be able to internalize all this manufacturing there. So, uh, we have done hundreds of those emitters now that have been molded and sintered uh, to get these this porous needles. Um, we have already fired some of those needles, and uh, our big focus right now is uh, streamlining all and scaling up all of our internal process, so, uh, uh, sharpening those needles and also infusing them with uh, indium. So that's what you can see on the right here, uh, kind of this whole high temperature process where we uh, infuse them with uh, the propellant. Uh, and then on the rest of the thruster, um, we are already pretty deep into mechanical testing. Um, one of the challenge is, of course, those tank uh, is that uh, of liquid metal that needs to be held for launch, and the tank is also at high um, voltage. So being able to to provide the thermal and, and insulation and electrical insulation of this tank is is always a, a big challenge. So we have already been doing some vibration testing and, and the qualification levels and that kind of thing to to be able to to deal with that. And then uh, we are also 
into right now uh, cathode testing, so validating all of our models uh, of neutralizer and performance and, and electron beam uh, to, to get there. So this project um, is partly founded uh, by ESA Artes uh, program. Um, and as part of it, we are also following uh, some of the ESA uh, development timeline and development uh, milestones. Uh, you might have already seen uh, last December the email about uh, successfully, successfully uh, passing PDR, um, where we already had already some uh, at the time um, uh, needle uh, elements uh, firing and and and, and uh, wetted thanks to uh, the research we have done with Fotec. Um, at this right now, uh, we are actually uh, receiving a lot of our own equipment to do this uh, those processes, so to be able to scale up and, and accelerate production of this. And we are looking toward a subscale um, kind of full performance testing there uh, before um, or end of this year, early next year, where uh, we would then be able to provide what we call this an interface and performance freeze milestone, where we'll be able to provide documentation to uh, potential customers for uh, such an ICD performance model, that kind of thing. So you can already uh, foresee what you would do in terms of uh, integration constraints and uh, how to best take advantage of the thruster. Uh, and in parallel, we're also procuring uh, quite a lot of equipment, so large uh, vacuum chamber to be able to uh, to fire the thrusters in the house and 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 uh, ramp up the production rate. And uh, we see a CDR in the fall. Um, of 24 uh, next year, with uh, before that, uh, hopefully quite a few uh, full scale uh, thruster firing uh, to validate all of our assumptions there. Uh, qualification will be done in two kind of steps where we have uh, mid 2025 uh, expecting uh, finishing all the environmental qualification um, testing, so vibration, thermal, radiation, performance validation, that kind of thing. And then uh, for lifetime endurance testing, uh, which will finish later. So, and as usual uh, on our things, we for people who are uh, in a hurry, we kind of uh, envision being able to deliver the first flight unit uh, before the end of the of the endurance testing for people who who have stricter timeline. All right, um, I think that was uh, most of my presentation, so I hope uh, it was clear, and then uh, I think we will move on to questions. Yes, so I will. Thank you, Lou, um, for your presentation yeah, and all the information you shared with us. Um, yeah. It was amazing to see the progress and also the successes you already had with your team and also the milestones that still lie ahead. Um, so during the presentation, the audience had the opportunity to ask questions, which uh, we collected. So also thank you to everyone who sent us their questions. And yeah, we have planned around 10 to 15 minutes for the Q&A, and I hope we can cover as many questions as possible. Um, So the first question, um, in your presentation, um, you showed that unlike impulsions, uh, other propulsion systems for the for the NEO, the PPU and the neutralizer will be outside of the propulsion system housing. No? So what was the main reason for this um, design decision? Yeah, so uh, the main idea there is that um, we saw that for some people, especially for larger spacecraft, it can be kind of a challenge to uh, adequately cool down the electronics uh, where the thruster is. So especially on the one kilowatt system where uh, even with, uh, let's say, 90 percent efficiency, you will still get up to 100 watts of um, heat that needs to be dissipated at the electronic side. So being able to place the electronics, uh, the PPU, wherever you want uh, makes it a lot easier uh, for integration uh, in, a, in a spacecraft, especially when some of the spacecraft have cold panel or that kind of thing. 
Uh, and then um, you only need to run the harness, uh, which will be like a low voltage and high voltage harness between uh, the PPU and then the thruster head and the neutralizer. Mm -hmm. um, so it is not in one housing, but it uh, still be easy to integrate. Um, there was another design change that you uh, showed in, also in detail um, for the emitter needles. Uh, when compared to impulsions, existing propulsion systems uh, where we have the needles in circles, you changed or uh, the design to parallel lines for the NEO. Uh, so what was the main reason for this uh, design change? Sure. Um, I mean, our main um, vision there is to really be able to pack as many needles as we can into this 15 inch separation ring. Uh, so this is why we ended up with a kind of a design like you see on the screen, uh, where you have uh, kind of rounded off corners. Um, and having linear emitter lets us do uh, quite um, like a more dense uh, packing. And we can increase the number of needles, which increase the thrust, but also the redundancy and let us operate the needles in a slightly more uh, optimal way, where we don't need to push as much current through each needles as, as we would need otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so it would it in, in let's say it also makes uh, the th whole uh, design more compact. If I exactly. understood this, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, another thing you showed in the presentation was uh, a comparison of different uh, propellants, also comparing price and availability. Uh, so just for the audience to know, or maybe you can explain a little bit more. Uh, for the Impulsion NEO, does this mean that a satellite manufacturer would have to purchase propellant separately or are there any additional filling operations required? No, so like with all of our uh, thrusters, um, there is like the propellant is included uh, uh, with the sale. Um, what we, so we ship the propellant full, uh, and since there is no high-pressure system, we can just ship it normally by any normal carrier. Um, and then you don't need any special GSE field carts operations uh, at customer facility. Uh, in fact, that's something where uh, so far we have never needed to do uh, go to a customer to help with integration at their facility. Um, and uh, so especially for small series where like, the GSE cost can be quite uh, high, uh, for us, the idea is that, uh, yeah, you don't need to do that. Um, and then in terms of availability, I mean, we have seen that the rare gas like uh, Xenon and even Krypton uh, are, had like a pretty volatile price. Uh, the good thing on Indium is that really it's a byproduct of normal um, metal refining, I think of nickel and cobalt uh, refining. Um, so the supply is not very limited, and uh, most of the market is dominated by electronics uh, or semiconductor manufacturing. So um, we only represent just very tiny things there. So unless you are, you know, uh, buying thousands of tons, uh, there is no big price volatility there. Mm -hmm. um, another question we have is. For the nano product family, there is uh, one product that has the thrust vectoring capabilities. Um, is this something that you have been looking into for the NEO as well for future developments? Or, yeah, will the NEO as it is now currently in development uh, also able to do thrust vectoring? Sure. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question because I think we have seen a lot of interest and in, on, on this thrust vectoring and especially with the, the missions that have reached uh, GEO uh, a few weeks back, uh, that was also with thrust vectoring. Um, one thing we have seen uh, is, oh, there's, there's two aspects to the question. So we didn't decide, we haven't decided right now on this version to do a thrust vectoring system. Uh, and for two reasons. One is um, for LEO, we do not see where most of the market is. Uh, we do not see that as uh, really a main feature that people decide between one system or the other. Um, and they would rather optimize cost than adding complexity. 
And then the second thing is that um, if we do this, if we did uh, the same passive uh, kind of choice vectoring system as what we have on electronic choice vectoring system as what we have on the Nano R3, the one you can see in the middle of the screen there, um, you would the thruster would need to be either bigger or lower thrust. And um, we thought that was not right now a compromise that that would be beneficial for the product uh, at this point. However. Um, in theory, there's nothing preventing us from doing this, uh, from from having a either uh, uh, electrostatic system uh, with a new set of electronics, or um, we have also already have some concept with some mechanism manufacturer to integrate directly their um, kind of gimbal system to the thruster housing, uh, where you wouldn't need to mount the thruster on a separate gimbal, but you would get something that would be um, all integrated at once. Uh, this is not right now a product that we offer, but that's some concept we have been playing with. Uh, and definitely, if there is large interest that could be pursued further. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, so another question that I don't know if you can answer directly, but I will ask you. Anyways, um, so it looks like we have uh, two voltages that are controlling all the needles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What impact does this have on thrust misalignment as it seems the needles are not able to be controlled individually? Question mark. Sure, yeah, that's always uh, um, <laughs> an important question on those large, uh, or like when we have all those arrays of small basically small thrusters in parallel, is that how do you balance everything to make sure that uh, you don't have uh, one side firing way more than the other? Um, and for this, we have two aspects. One is that we can do some matching, uh, so kind of emitter selection and, and place them strategically to kind of balance everything. And then the second thing is that with this kind of um, uh, high number, uh, you end up averaging any, uh, any offset pretty closely. Um, so you would have to be very unlucky to really lose like a full half of the system to be able to, to have a significant shift in thrust vector. In a normal kind of uh, assumption of, for example, we have 80% of the needles working, which is kind of our baseline usually for, for the proportion system, where we don't need to have 100% of the needles to get the performance that we show. Um, the the needles working more or less uh, on one side or the other kind of average each other, and you end up with a thrust vector that not, doesn't really move from from the the center point. Uh, I think we are like less than a millimeter, uh, and then that's something we characterize at delivery for people to be able to shim or like um, or tune the positioning of the thruster um, for for their specific center of mass. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. We'll just check again if there are uh, additional questions. So, because, um, yeah, if there are currently not uh, any more questions for, for now, uh, Lou, thank you again for uh, joining us today. Uh, it was a pleasure having you. And of course, uh, thank you everyone in the audience. Uh, we hope you, we could give you a great update on, and insights into our latest developments. And if you are interested in the Impulse Neo um, and want to know more detailed information, um, feel free to reach out to our sales team. We will share uh, their contacts in a separate email, in a follow-up email uh, to everyone. Um, and also, if you uh, want to, you can meet our team at the Space Tech Expo Europe, which is um, taking place in November uh, in Bremen. So if you want to say hi, uh, visit us at booth A20. Uh, our team will be happy to meet you. And we will also have a 3D printed model of the Impulsion Neo propulsion system there, in case you want to take a closer look at it. And with this, I say um, thank you to everyone for joining us and we wish you a great day and see you soon.